Okay, I believe we've got our technical difficulties worked out and we can resume testimony. Thank you so much for your patience. So can you hear me now? You can. So um, I am, did you hear any of my testimony at all? Because I'm told the public didn't. So you, um, why? Would you like to would you like to start over um, from the beginning, Mr. McMahon? Would, would... Sure, that'd be fine. Thank you. Just to make sure we did it all. Thank you. Um, very good. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is an honor to appear before the City Council today, uh, and I want to thank uh, the Chair of the Committee of Public Safety, uh, Councilwoman uh, Councilmember Adrian Adams. Uh, and the fellow members who are here today, Council Members Miller, Powers, Menchaca, Rosenthal, Brannon, uh, Holden, Gibson, and Cabrera. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership in the city. I'd also wanna thank Staten Island's Council uh, Delegation, uh, Council Member Debbie Rose, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, and Council Member Joe Pirelli for their continued ongoing advocacy on behalf of the people of Staten Island. I also want to thank our partners, in particular from uh, Mark J, uh, Marcus Solis, and Deanna Logan, as well as uh, the defenders uh, the, uh, uh, from Legal Aid here in Staten Island, the 18B attorneys, uh, the private defense bar, uh, for working with us together to get us through uh, the difficulties of the COVID crisis and to start getting our criminal justice system here on Staten Island back on track. When I last appeared before this council, we were just getting ready to relaunch trials again in Richmond County Supreme Court uh, since the onset of the pandemic. Today, Madam Chairwoman, I can report that we have safely completed three felony trials to verdict. A fourth trial was resolved with a plea during jury selection and a fifth, which is a murder trial is currently underway. Fraught with logistical challenges brought by COVID safety precautions, this was no easy feat. But with determination and collaboration between them amongst the many partners and the willing public who nobly showed up and performed their civic duty as jurors, this necessary step forward was made possible. That said, trials have yet to resume in Richmond County's criminal court. In criminal court, we continue to work with our partners in OCA and the defense court to resolve as many of the cases in pretrial as possible but we will not be fully back on track until we have trials in criminal court, especially with the advent of the mandate to have jury trials uh, in uh, B, uh, B misdemeanor and unspecified, unspecified misdemeanor cases. Like other counties, we have seen a, an uptick in the backlog of cases in DATs in criminal court amid the pandemic, which presents a difficult task for our office. The court and the defense bar to work through in the months ahead. For DA offices across the city, the challenge of meeting discovery obligations on the unrealistic timeline set by the state legislature in 2019 uh, criminal justice reform laws amid a surge of violence uh, and in particular in shootings and homicide cases while also balancing a ballooning backlog of cases is indeed daunting. And the resumption of trials and the full functioning of the courts is the only way to clear some of this backlog, but will take time and resources, particularly personnel resources, to fully accomplish this. And as we face the obstacles ahead, our biggest challenge is a fiscal one created by the administration and the council, which threatens us with dozens of layoffs at this worst possible juncture. And to be sure, we cannot, without financial relief, meet our, our obligations under the criminal justice reform law and keep the people of Staten Island and the city of New York safe. So please allow me briefly to explain uh, what I'm referring to. At the end of 2019, the city gave the five DA offices and the special narcotics prosecutor money to hire staff and build infrastructure to respond to the new criminal justice reform mandates passed in Albany that went into effect in January, 2020. The administration, the council approved and instructed our office to expeditiously hire 61 new positions to meet these demands. At the time, these positions were funded on a pro rata basis for fiscal year 20, and that is seven months instead of the full 12 months. We were promised that in fiscal year 21, um, 
the adopt and the adopted, these positions would be fully uh, funded, assuming that we filled the spots by that point. By spring of 2020, we had hired over 95% of these positions, yet the full funding has never followed. There's no questions that these question that these positions are vital for our agency to fulfill our mandated obligations under the new criminal justice reforms. In fact, in an effort to provide responsible, good faith projections as to our needs, we may have underestimated uh, some of these. But we're not here to ask for more. We're simply here to ask that you give us the money promised so that we don't have to uh, run into the uh, possibility of not fulfilling our obligations. Over the past year, we have had to uh, delay start dates, implemented a hiring freeze, and accumulate a significant number of vacancies to avoid layoffs. And looking forward to fiscal year 22, we face a significant PS budget deficit of approximately 1.5 million because of this unfulfilled commitment and gap in funds. Without this funding, we will have to lay off dozens of staff members on top of the unfilled vacancies we have already accumulated. This at a time when the city is facing a public safety crisis, increase in shootings, and we have to now implement all of the criminal justice reforms, which uh, discovery reforms, which were on hold pursuant to governor's orders, and now those have been lifted. We are facing a budget and a fiscal crisis here in our office, and this is true in the other prosecuting offices as well. So we urge you, please, as you sit down at the budget negotiating table, to simply give us what was promised and allow us to fulfill our mission. That being said, I'd just like to discuss briefly where we are with court operations and how it is affecting uh, our ability uh, to uh, meet our mandates. In Richmond County, grand juries resumed in August of 2020, but they were paused due to an uptick in COVID cases. We resumed in January and have been operational since. Supreme Court trials resumed in April 2021. All court personnel returned to the courthouse in May. And currently, the, the criminal court inventory in Richmond County is just below 1,700 cases, but there are also approximately 800 to 900 unarranged DATs not reflected in that 1,700 number. Although at one point during the pandemic, the criminal court inventory of cases that were pending over a year old had ballooned to over 200 cases, we have worked with the defense bar and the court uh, and Mock J to bring that number down to about 130 cases. And this is despite not having trials resume in criminal court yet, as I had mentioned. There's no tentative plan that we are aware of for trials to resume in criminal court at this time, but our ADAs are all preparing their cases and will be ready when necessary. Our offices worked hard to maintain low arrest to arraignment times, even amid the pandemic. In April 2021, our average arrest to arraignment time was 14 uh, hours and 51 minutes, bringing our annual average to just over 16 hours. I'm personally very proud of this because when I came into office, the Staten Island average was over 20 hours, well before the COVID pandemic. We have been told that OCA is committed to making virtual appearances a fixture of court proceedings where appropriate. Some of this depends on future executive orders by the governor, and modifications to the criminal procedure law. And lastly, the court began in-person appearances for unarraigned DATs on June 1st. Defendants are notified to appear in person in the arraignment part, and our arraignment judge has been calling about 25 unarraigned DATs per day. And this includes the DATs that uh, come in during the pandemic, as well as all the DATs uh, on the warrants calendar. So as we sit before you today, over a year into readjusting our world to fight a dangerous global pandemic, it goes without saying that this time has been filled with challenges and setbacks. Despite these difficult times, however, I am proud that my office was able to adapt and persevere. We have partnered with the police department and others, as I said, the defense bar, to keep the people of Staten Island as safe as possible. We remain vigilant in our dedication to the rule of law protection of victims of crime, and the overall improvement of public safety in our borough. Our staff and ADAs have performed admirably, and I'm very proud of them all. So I thank you for your time and consideration of my testimony. I'd be glad to uh, answer any questions about the subjects of this hearing or any around public safety, uh, as you wish. DA McMahon, it is always a pleasure to see you, sir. 
And I can't thank you enough for hanging in there with us uh, in spite of the technical difficulties. Um, your, your testimony is so heartfelt and thank you for representing the DAs across the city this morning. You represent them in excellence as always. Um, your budget uh, plea has not fallen on deaf ears, certainly not by myself. And I certainly feel that your request is most reasonable. And I will uh, do my best to make sure that you along with your colleagues are taken care of as far as our, our budget uh, from the city, we will do our best to fight to maintain and restore that um, uh, for you. So thank you for bringing that again to my attention. Um, we know that you've been through so much, your staff has been through so much. What I'd like to know is what coordination have Mock J, DCAS and OCA done with your office in terms of the safety of reopening the courthouses and what still needs to be done? And do you have a sense of how your staff feels right now about fully physically returning to the courthouses? Yep. I think that's a great question, Madam Chair, Webin, and thank you for hearing our concerns on the budget. Uh, and as you understand, I'm just trying to get operational. I'm not trying to ask for more. I'm just trying to get what, because I don't want to do layoffs. This would be a terrible time to do that because of the COVID, the economy, but also public safety. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's you know, as you know, and I'm sure uh, with, with the council and you hear from members in, in, in your district, getting things started again has always been a work in progress. And that's the way it's been uh, here in the courts. Uh, but we are uh, very uh, you know, fond, if you will, of the work that we do with Mock J. Uh, they're great people who work there and they're trying to do their best. Um, and what we've done uh, in our, you know, in the physical space is that all of the courtrooms now are outfitted with plexiglass. The grand jurors and the jurors continue to be uh, separated. And, and, and as you heard, using full courtrooms now for the grand jury, um, limiting uh, access uh, within constitutional uh, bounds to people in the courtroom so that trials can progress. And overall, uh, our people are are cautious, nervous, worried, uh, but they're doing their jobs like so many other New Yorkers. They're stepping up and doing what they have to do. Um, there have been some frustrations, uh, as you know, from their non-appearance at the hearing today, OCA can be a difficult partner, uh, but somehow we've got great leadership here in Staten Island under Judge Desmond Green, and we are able to get up and running. It's not perfect. Um, space is always an issue. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have enough space for our personnel as it is, but all that being said, I, I feel confident that if we continue the way we are going, and let's not forget, vaccination is so important, um, and if we are able to do that, we will get up and running. Big concern is criminal court um, trials, uh, because as we know, not all cases go to trial. In fact, if it's 10%, it's a lot. But that is sort of what hangs over the criminal uh, procedure uh, uh, process. And if people know there is some sort of end, they make decisions uh, that will allow uh, uh, justice to be delivered in a timely fashion. If there is no end, it can continue forever, whether it's myself, my staff, the defendants, defense counsel, whatever, the courts, they let things linger. And you know, as we know, uh, that's not good for anyone. So we've made a lot of progress. We have a lot more work to do. Thank you very much. Uh, in, in looking at uh, the, the um, jury, uh, how the juries have been going, um, I went over this a little bit with Mock J a little while ago. How many grand juries have you actually been able to impanel over the last few months? And um, are there enough to meet your, your workload, your backlog? Yeah, so, and, and as you heard, our, our caseload is a lot for a community our size, but it's, it's not, you know, when you compare it to uh, Brooklyn and, and Queens and, and Manhattan and the Bronx, uh, it's, it's, I have to be honest, it's not. So we maintain one full grand jury per month. Uh, they meet 11 days out of the month. Uh, we'd like to expand that a few days and that's something we've been working on. Uh, but overall, we've been in, in pretty much normal operations since January 1st. There were fits and starts last year. Uh, but we were able in January to start clearing up uh, the backlog of, of cases uh, that had been sort of stayed because of executive orders. Uh, and we are now at a place where we're operating fairly successfully. We never had to, we were, we lost 
few grand jurors because of COVID, but we, uh, since January 1st, we've been doing okay. So we're, uh, thanks, as I said, to the intrepid uh, Staten Islanders who get the call for civic duty and come in, uh, the court personnel, our partners in the defense bar, the police department, everyone, we're, we're doing okay uh, with that. Uh, and and uh, really, uh, we are no, no longer in the space that we used to be in, uh, in, a, in an office building where across the street, they have a full uh, courtroom, sort of a full wing of the old courthouse here in Staten Island that we use for the grand jury now. So as long as we have those space opportunities, I think we'll be okay. That's to hear. My, my final question was going to be dealing with the backlog, but it doesn't sound like you've got a backlog right now, which is, uh, so, so do you. So, yeah, so it's, it's, I'm not going to, I mean, we're, we're, we're okay. Um, and uh, in, in that regard, again, um, unindicted felonies, you know, we're working on those numbers, uh, indicted felonies, getting them resolved or getting them to trial. It's a process that's beginning now and, and uh, we're somewhat okay with it. Greatly concerned, as I mentioned now, being able to meet our obligations under the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Uh, but I know you hear me on that. I certainly do. And I will, uh, I'll thank you for your testimony. I'll go to council to see if any of my colleagues have questions at this time. Thank you, Chair. I don't see any hands raised at this time, but I'll just remind any other council members to use the Zoom raise hand function. And seeing no hands, uh, thank you to DA McMahon. We'll now turn to members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, DA McMahon. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike on in our in-person council hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelists should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'm going to read the first uh, four names so that you know who's coming up. Just give me one moment. First up will be Tina Luongo from the Legal Aid Society, followed by Young Mi Lee from Brooklyn Defender Services, Ann Matthews from Bronx Defenders, and Elizabeth Fisher from Neighborhood Defender Services Department. Um, Tina Luongo from Legal Aid. Time begins. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for holding this very critical uh, hearing at this uh, time, Councilwoman uh, Adams and members of the committee. I'm Tina Longo. I'm the Chief Defender at the Legal Aid Society. It's a citywide public defender, and I'm joined by uh, members of the other defense, uh, our sister organizations. Um, I, I want to sort of frame out uh, and, and respond to, to some of the concerns brought forward in here, particularly around the number of shootings um, and the reasons why um, um, and some of the claims made uh, about the reasons why uh, our city is facing this. Uh, there is no doubt that COVID was a pandemic like none other that swept not only our city, our state, but our nation and our world. It left people um, homeless. Uh, it left people unemployed. It, it, it uh, abruptly cut critical mental, and, uh, mental health and, and medical services. And as we all know, and we must reckon with, it highlighted the disparity to BIPOC communities that existed long before COVID hit us. And it's that backdrop that I sort of wanna to respond to the rhetoric we have heard through this entire year and a half about the causes of sort of violent crime uptick. And in fact, use some of the data that was presented here about the number of felony, felony matters that a backlog and the number of arrests that have been made, many of them on violent crimes during this entire year and a half. And to also say that the courts are not reopening, we are resuming in person. In fact, the courts have been open. B 
vis-a-vis remotely, and none of us thought that that was actually in the best interest of anybody for public defenders, most importantly, our clients who face a tech divide like no other. Um, But the reality of the situation is the uptick of violent crimes isn't because our courts are closed, and it isn't because of bail reform. It is because a pandemic like no other severed the vital needs and traumatized and re-traumatized people in our city. It also sort of raised the disparity of lack of services that we know existed before COVID. And the actually the thing I wanted to talk about as we think about resuming in person is in fact centering um, the folks who have been in custody, detained and held in our, in, in our city because of either bail or other holds um, and pivot away for a moment about sort of the rhetoric of NYPD with no data and the sort of idea that somehow the answer to all of this is deter people by holding more people in and talk about the people who have been held in. Because when the governor stopped all of the executive orders, that meant due process to those people who have been in who haven't had a grand jury as fast as they could have, who have are waiting for their discovery. And actually I want to sort of frame it this way, that the one concern we continue to have as public defenders, and, and my colleagues will talk about other things, but I want to focus on the health Understood. and safety and humanity of the people who are held in custody. Because if the measure of society is how we treat the people who were detained, waiting for arraignments or waiting for their day in court. Well, New York City has failed and DCAS is not here to talk about it. Long before COVID, what we knew is the holding areas of our criminal courts have been a shameful demonstration of the lack of concern that our city sometimes has when they cage BIPOC people who are charged um, and merely only accused. Uh, Poor quality of air vermin and roach infestation, filth and sometimes human waste, uh, and and the outcry of clients to be treated with humanity have long been a problem in our city. So when COVID hit and the public defenders immediately went to the city, March 19th, 2020 was our first letter. We began to push what needed to be done, better air quality, sanitation, make sure masks happen, social distancing, don't crowd. Month after month after month, we sent reminders, we called to action, we made meetings. The public defenders pushed locally, we pushed OCA, we emailed MockJ, DCAS, DOC, NYPD. And while um, uh, Deputy Director Logan did testify that there were remediation, we are still waiting for a full and complete list to ensure that every holding area, every arraignment booth that that clients are in and our staff now have to return to have been remediated. Because what we knew from DCAS is the public areas of the courthouses were remediated uh, months and months and months ago. But when we followed up with a question about whether or not the non-public areas where BIPOC communities are held, waiting for their day in court, waiting to be arraigned, we still have not gotten the full list and we are about to return. So this is not only about public safety, this is about humanity. And I want to frame and reframe the conversation around that as my colleagues from the sister organizations talk about the rest of what needs to happen. Because there is no doubt, and let me be very clear that there's a bit of rhetoric that the public defenders don't want to go back to court. Let me be very clear that we do. We will always stand with our clients. We will always stand with our clients, whether we are standing one foot away from them or whether we are in a video. And that is why we need to change this conversation about resuming safely, ensuring that we don't go back to all purpose parts with 200 people. And most importantly, to have transparent, data-driven, efficient and effective plans and that we get communicated those plans and this council get those plans and those plans be posted on OCA and Mock J's website, the same as we post data about how many arrests we have made for violent crimes. 
That is what I ask that this city turn to as we go back, hopefully to a better, more humane way in which we treat the people that we cage during the pendency of their trials. And with that, I will turn it over to my sisters from the other organizations. Thank you very much. Uh, next up will be Young Me Lee from Brooklyn Defender Services, followed by Ann Matthews from Bronx Defenders. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Young Me Lee, and I'm the legal director in the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender S Services. I want to thank the Committee on Public Safety and Chair Adams in particular for inviting us to testify today. I join in my colleagues' testimonies about the resumption of in person appearances. My testimony today will focus on in-person trials, uh, although my written testimony covers other aspects. The ability to have trials is obviously of paramount importance, but they must occur in person, but not in name only. In-person trials can occur and can be done safely without compromising important constitutional rights, including the rights to effective assistance of counsel, an impartial jury, effective confrontation, public trials, and other due process considerations. The right to an impartial jury includes the right to a fair cross-section of jurors. Given the disparate impact of COVID-19 across the city, let alone the country, we are concerned about the ability to obtain fair cross-sections of jury pools. Courts must be aware of this heightened concern and ensure transparency and the ability to obtain master jury selection lists so that the attorneys can ensure that we are in fact obtaining a fair cross-section. In, in order to fulfill the right to effective assistance of counsel, of counsel and the right to confront witnesses, courts must also ensure that courtrooms are large enough to accommodate socially distanced jurors that are sitting, but also to ensure that jurors can see and hear the witnesses. Jurors, as you all know, must make important credibility determinations. If they cannot see the facial expressions or properly hear voice intonations, they cannot make um, that, they cannot fulfill that important duty. Additionally, attorneys must be able to view, to, to not just view the witnesses, but also to see all the jurors at the same time. Conducting a trial with some jurors looking at the backs of attorneys implicates assistance of counsel rights. This is particularly concerning as we have BDS attorneys on trial right now where jurors are so, so spread apart that they cannot, the attorneys cannot see all the juries all at once at any given time. The right to effect, effective, assistance of count, effective assistance of counsel also means attorneys should have adequate time to communicate with their clients both before and during the trial, inside and outside the courtroom. Discussing the right to testify and then preparing a client to testify is vital to effective representation. As such, incarcerated individuals should never be rushed back to Rikers, nor should they be produced late to court. The right to a public trial also means that the public should be able to hear and see the trial at all times. Family members and loved ones especially should never be excluded from the courtroom. Finally, we understand that there may be enormous pressure to complete a trial and for jurors to render verdicts. Courts must ensure that there is adequate time to deliberate and in a safe place. Coercive charges such as Allen charges should be used sparingly. I wanna thank uh, this committee for holding this critical hearing on the court's resumption of in-person appearances. The city must ensure that there is a plan to ensure the safety of all faculty of all actors in the courtroom, that defenders are made aware of the plan. So far, as of this date, we have not been aware, made aware of these plans to ensure the safety of all participants as we resume in-person criminal court arraignments in early July, and as we, as we have already resumed in-person jury trials. I do want to note that uh, while we are doing this trial, which we started in early June, it's become clear and apparent to us that there has been no uh, guidance given to courts uh, in terms of how to even select juries safely uh, and then to conduct uh, these trials as jurors are spread out throughout the courtroom. I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Next up will be Ann Matthews from the Bronx Defenders followed by Elizabeth Fisher from Neighborhood Defender Services. 
Clock is Good ready. Good morning. My name is Ann Matthews, and I am the managing director of the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you, Chair Adams and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. In pre-pandemic times, people charged with criminal offenses would routinely appear in person dozens of times in court before their cases ended. At each appearance, a person could spend hours sitting on hard benches, unable to access phones or even read a newspaper or a book, having taken a day off from work or school, arranged childcare, only to be called and have a court appearance that could easily last less than a minute. In New York's criminal courts, in which the majority of cases are for lower level misdemeanors, the process of court itself has often been the punishment. Now is the time to make good on reimagining the future of New York City's criminal courts and using the lessons learned, not only from the past year and a half, but all of the years prior to truly transform the ways in which New York City's criminal courts operate. In effecting that transformation, the experiences, the needs, and the preferences of those appearing in criminal courts, the majority of whom are Black and Brown New Yorkers, must be front and center. New York City's criminal courts have remained open. As my colleagues have said, they have remained open throughout this entire public health crisis and have continued to hear cases throughout that time. But how those cases have been heard has changed dramatically from pre-pandemic times. No longer are our clients appearing in person, but have instead been appearing remotely, virtually, or have even had court appearances excused altogether. It took a deadly global pandemic to demonstrate what many defenders have long been saying. There is no need to force people to appear in person or even at all at most appearances in New York City's criminal courts. In-person appearances should be limited to certain fundamental appearances, arraignments, hearings, and trials though people should always have the option of appearing in person if they so choose. They should otherwise have the option to appear virtually or simply be excused altogether. All appearances for incarcerated clients should be in person, absent an individual's express request not to be brought to court. Choice and autonomy are critical. The court should prioritize the cases of people in custody and those cases in which real rights, interests, and collateral consequences are at stake. Thank you. Reducing, if I may just complete, reducing the number of required in-person appearances, providing choice and autonomy to those appearing in criminal courts, and prioritizing cases for people in custody are concrete steps towards focusing the limited resources of a court system where they are most needed. And such steps also advance the promise to reimagine the future of the courts and to remedy the current racial and economic inequities so deeply embedded in the current criminal court system. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Elizabeth Fisher. Good morning. Thank you to the committee for holding this critically important hearing. My name is Elizabeth Fisher and I'm the managing attorney of the criminal defense practice at Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. I want to join in the concerns and recommendations of my colleagues at the Legal Aid Society, Brooklyn Defender Services and Bronx Defenders. For the, our clients, the pandemic has been an incredibly difficult time. Um, for too many, it has meant a denial of due process, additional months living under the burden of criminal charges, and often extended periods incarcerated due to the suspension of speedy trial laws. With all of these consequences for those criminally accused, however, has come one development that could be used to lessen the often catastrophic effects of facing criminal charges on our clients, and that 
is the creation of a system for virtual appearances in criminal supreme and family courts. Even before being convicted, the process of the criminal legal system renders punishment, leaving people in a more precarious position simply by the fact of being uh, accused of a crime. Prior to the pandemic on an average day, thousands of New Yorkers would wait in packed criminal court courtrooms across the boroughs for hours, simply to do things such as get a new court date, nothing more. To avoid the disastrous effects of missing work and school, many people unfortunately choose to plead guilty rather than fight the charges against them. And too often the discussion with our clients about whether to plead guilty is not about whether they actually committed the offense charge, but whether they can afford to miss work or school to fight a case that will likely drag on for months and require dozens of days in court of missed work and missed school. I will never forget one of my very first clients in juvenile in family court, uh, 13 years old, who decided to plead guilty despite having maintained his innocence because his mom's job told him that if she missed one more day of work to appear in his numerous court appearances, she would lose her job. Our clients should not have to be forced to choose between due process and their family's livelihoods. During the pandemic, the implementation of virtual court appearances when our clients consent has lessened the burden of the process substantially for many of our clients. Instead of waiting for hours in packed courtrooms for a 30 second appearance, they can log into a virtual appearance during a break from work. The use of virtual court with our clients consent for minor appearances has meant countless hours of productivity has been saved. Thousands of persons have been able to actualize their due process rights without experiencing devastating effects on their careers and educations. While the efforts to create this system were born out of necessity by the pandemic, Virtual appearances will be needed by our clients long after the pandemic to preserve their jobs and educations. As the courts return to in-person appearances, we hope that the court will not revert back to business as usual, where our clients must spend endless hours in court waiting for minor appearances that could easily have been completed virtually. We urge the council to encourage and support OCA to implement the permanent use of virtual appearances on consent of our clients to lessen the impact of the criminal legal process as punishment of the accused. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now turn it to the chair for um, questions and then we'll resume with the remaining public witnesses. Yeah, you know, I, I have to just say, you know, for those of you that have been in oversight uh, hearings with me, it is always so compelling to hear from the defenders. Uh, full disclosure, I have family members who are defenders and um, your, your, your work, you know, your drive, your passion, you know, for what you do and for your clients always strike a particular nerve with me. So again, I thank you all for always just pouring out your heart and soul in these hearings, because it's very important that not, not just my committee hear this, but that the public hear this as well and know what goes on behind the scenes when it comes to our most marginalized communities and the treatment that they get, particularly of concern always with the backroom operations um, and the conditions, Tina, that you continue to bring out um, that people don't really see at face value in our court in our courthouses. So thank you for that. Uh, and you, you expounded on the question that I had as far as virtual appearances. And Ms. Fisher, you took it even a step further for me. Young me, you were right in there in the pocket as well um, in, in this very uh, important testimony when it comes to the necessity for the option of virtual appearances and what that means and what this pandemic over the past year or so has shown us when it comes to trial, when it comes to compassion, when it comes to humanity, all of those things that need to be taken very, very seriously and moved. I mean, all of that has to be reformed, changed, moved, because things cannot continue to be the way they were pre-pandemic. There is an opportunity for the city to get this right and to change the way that business as usual is handled. So in some ways, we've been brutalized by this pandemic, and in many others, our eyes have been opened to learn how to do things better and how to treat our constituents and our clients better. There, there is a better way. So just know again that everything that you say always is taken to heart by me. I'm very sensitive when it comes to this issue. These issues 
particularly, uh, Tina, of humanity that you always bring, you know, with such passion before my committee. So I'm so grateful for you uh, for that. I just want to touch on one thing. And maybe, Tina, you can expound on this or anyone uh, really. When we talk about information that's received from Mach J and DCAS and OCA, how much information um, have you actually received from these agencies regarding pandemic modifications made to the courthouse? Do you receive them regularly? How frequently are you getting this information? How does it, what does that look like? It, uh, thank you very much for sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of wanting more detail on this. We have not gotten regular ongoing information. And um, we did receive, as I said, early about September, uh, um, uh, we did receive a full list of the public areas showing that the MERV ratings of all the courthouses, including those uh, family court, criminal court, and some of the housing court, that most uh, of the uh, DCAS controlled spaces were public areas were MERV 13 or higher. When we did a follow up as to the non public areas, right, the central booking area, the arraignment areas, the holding areas behind the courtrooms where clients are held pre arraignment or if bail is set brought to court from DOC's facilities. Um, we got a, a bit of a runaround. There was a lot of pointing of fingers. MOXJ has taken the lead. I do appreciate them for trying to get this information. But we even, we even had our CEO um, be co in communication with the general counsel of DCAS, to which the last information they provided, uh, DCAS provided back, was you have to go to OCA and DOC. It's their controlled facilities, which obviously is an inappropriate response, right? The, DCAS are the people who care for those facilities, are in charge of those facilities, and should be coordinating. So we are asking that not only do defenders get that information, but that information be posted, what the remediation was. If a HVAC system could not be brought to a MERV 13, they are, all of the experts say there are remediation measures, standalone HEPA filters that can be used. And what we are asking is that that be confirmed that every area in which we are detaining an individual be remediated and we be told and it be posted, more importantly, so that the people who are held also understand that the space that they're in has been remediated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the only other question that I have, um, and I maybe guess what the answer is, is uh, for any of you, do you have any data on longer incarceration terms for clients that are detained pre-trial? I can speak for legal aid society that obviously we know because of the suspension of the executive orders, lack of grand juries, no hearing and then trials that those incarceration rates, those detention rates are in fact longer. And that speedy trial was actually um, what was actually suspended for uh, uh, almost a year, right, where the governor has lifted that now. Um, and, and I think that that's what DA, DA McMahon is talking about when he says that discovery was going to flow. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to my, uh, my uh, other colleagues to sort of talk about that. But obviously, we know that to be true. That being said, we are doing what we can as public defenders to make sure our social workers, our investigators are doing the work to prepare cases that we are analyzing discovery that we do receive um, and make sure that we are ready. Um, we are advising our clients. Uh, we're video conferencing. We're even, in fact, going to Rikers to visit our clients, to prepare for tr trial and hearing if possible and when it happens. But obviously, for all the reasons we talked about today, um, things had, have, in fact, been longer for those who are, who are held in. So at, at Brooklyn Defender Services, we don't have specific data, but uh, I, I can tell you that as I work uh, on individual cases with all the criminal defense lawyers, uh, whether it's through writ practice or making bail arguments, it's clear that the executive orders that suspended 3030 and 19080 uh, definitely had an impact on uh, lengthy uh, periods of incarceration 
Um, there have been a couple of isolated cases where uh, DOC's failure to produce individuals in court who were scheduled to be released into programs were delayed by a week or so. Um, so there are all different reasons for uh, these really lengthy and unnecessary uh, periods of detention. Uh, but in terms of, unfortunately, in terms of specific data, we don't have the hard numbers, but it definitely um, exists. And I will just sort of echo Tina and Young Me here and say, um, you know, that, that the concern for our clients who are in custody, many of whom were in custody prior to the pandemic and who literally had um, their cases in a legal limbo status uh, for close to a year, and for many, it continues. Um, it is, you know, we are concerned, obviously, for the well-being of all of our clients, but it is why we are putting such particular emphasis as we look toward the increased resumption of in-person appearances and especially expanded trial capacity that we are focusing um, so much of our interest and attention on the needs of our incarcerated clients and hoping uh, for prioritization within the court system for those individuals for all the reasons um, that everyone has shared here today in the panel. Uh, so much great information. And again, you know, I wanna thank all of you um, for, all, for always, you know, just being, you know, so at the top of your game. It's just unfortunate that, you know, the situation continues. Um, these hearings uh, are going to continue um, to get this out um, so that we can continue to partner together to fix this thing. Um, something's got to give. And unfortunately, I think it's the pandemic that is causing something to finally give. So I thank you all once again for your testimony today. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will now turn to the remaining public witnesses, who I believe are also public defenders, perhaps testifying in their individual capacities. Um, next up will be Lisa Oda from the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, uh, followed by Roy Wasserman, who is a senior staff attorney with the Criminal Defense Division of Legal Aid, and uh, Ed Ennis. Um, Lisa Oda. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today on the reopening of criminal courts. My name is Lisa Ota, and I'm the president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, United Auto Workers Local 2325. ALAA represents over 2,000 public interest attorneys and advocates in, New York, in the New York City metro area at 20 nonprofit legal service providers. And every day, our members fight for justice for poor and low-income New Yorkers. Our members include public defenders and staff at the Legal Aid Society, Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem, the Bronx Defenders, and the Queens Defenders. With the imminent reopening of in-person appearances in the criminal courts, I'm here to ask for the committee's support in pressing OCA and other agencies to provide current real-time health and safety information, as well as to use a common sense approach to reopening in-person criminal court proceedings and to find a way to use this as an opportunity to make significant and lasting changes in how we effectuate justice. Since the COVID-19 outbreak began, we have learned that this is a virus that is most dangerous and crowded poorly ventilated buildings with inadequate fresh air and, fil and air filtration. This is basically a description of our New York City courthouses. To date, we have received no detailed information on mechanical upgrades, testing results, or detailed plans on occupancy limits in specific locations. And yet, in-person arraignments are reopening imminently. Criminal arraignments by their very nature require significant staffing, including court personnel, the NYPD, corrections, prosecutors, interpreters, court reporters, and defense attorneys. For years, our members have been working arraignments in small, crowded, poorly ventilated spaces, like interview booths and holding areas, and they are often speaking with multiple people in close proximity for extended periods of time. Moreover, at least one arraignment court used in Queens is particularly noteworthy for being so cramped, there is no ability to physically distance. These conditions in, in these spaces are notoriously filthy, and our members have seen no significant improvements in the courthouses since the beginning of the pandemic. For everyone involved, we must minimize risk as much as possible. 
ALAA and other legal service providers have been asking for basic information about remediation efforts OCA has undertaken to minimize these risks of transmission of the COVID-19 virus and to make sure the courthouses are as safe as possible moving forward. Last month, OCA provided a report from AKF Consulting listing 23 re recommendations for safety in the New York State courthouses and a spreadsheet from September listing the MERV filter rate, filtration ratings in various courts around the city that covered public areas. They've also recently shared a spreadsheet which shows where enhanced air filtration has allegedly been implemented. But to date, OCA, DCAST, and any other government agency has not provided any significant details on the implementation of these recommendations, including areas that will soon be heavily occupied. And this is not acceptable. We are seeking basic assurances and confirmation that OCA has implemented reasonable preventative measures that will ensure the health and safety of everyone who will be required to enter these spaces soon. A report and a few spreadsheets are not enough to rely on. Moreover, it must be noted that AFK did not conduct in-person inspections of the courthouses. And this is why we're asking for a neutral third party expert to be allowed to inspect these premises and share those results with interested parties. ALA has requested access to the courthouse in which in-person arrangements will soon begin to conduct indoor environmental inspections with our expert microecologies. And our experts um, in health and safety at the UAW and microecologies have examined these reports and agree with the recommendations, um, but we need to ensure that all of the areas, public and non-public, have been properly remediated. And this is an easy and reasonable solution to the lack of information that has been provided to the public. Being transparent and providing imp information about the implementation of the government's own expert recommendation serves everyone's interest in ensuring the best possible health and safety conditions in the New York City courthouses. We're asking for real-time sharing of information about remediation efforts, providing regular maintenance records, detailed policies on cleaning protocols, and ensuring that physical dist distancing and masking policies are being enforced. This will provide our members, clients, court staff, and everyone else the insurances they need to know that New York City courthouses are safe. And on a final note, we must not forget some of the things that we've learned in the past year. This pandemic has given us the unique opportunity to reevaluate how justice is served. Justice is not sitting in the courthouse all day to adjourn a case, causing clients and litigants to miss a day of work or finding themselves unable to obtain childcare. And we appreciate the courts have found ways to work through this pandemic, and we want to partner moving forward to continue using new methods that are working to guarantee access to justice. We are all committed to justice and equality. And by reevaluating how the court does business, we can make steps towards our shared commitment to racial and social justice. Let us use this as an opportunity to make changes we need to balance the scales of justice towards fairness and equity and let good grow from something so devastating. And I'm here today to offer the union's assistance in this effort and to demand transparency and information about whether recommendations that OCA's own experts have provided have been implemented. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, next up will be Roy Wasser. Thank you so much. I wanna thank the committee for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, my name is Roy Wasserman. I've been an attorney with the Criminal Defense Division of Legal Aid Society for 34 years. And I want to um, emphasize some of the points that have been made and give you kind of an on the ground view of the problems in the arraignment areas that have been mentioned before. My colleagues and I work eight hour arraignment shifts two to three times a month, interviewing clients who have been arrested. We conduct these interviews in booths that are no bigger than broom closets. These rooms are in use 16 to 17 hours a day, seven days per week, 365 days a year. We speak to each other in private with doors closed. These tiny booths are hidden from the public, tucked behind the courtrooms. These cramped booths contain two sides, one for our clients and one for the lawyers. Each side is not much bigger than an airplane bathroom. There's no ventilation, no windows, no filtration in these rooms. And from what I can tell, none in the holding areas where our clients remain for hours. Once in the booths, the interviews can last anywhere from five minutes to as long as an hour, depending on a lot of factors. My colleagues have been provided with very little, little information has been mentioned. I recently visited these areas. I spoke with NYPD, court officers and clerks who were present. 
I was told by NYPD officers that the air on the inmate side of the holding areas is continuously stuffy and not ventilated. That side of the arraignment area is controlled exclusively by NYPD and is often packed with far too many clients to fit into the cells pre-pandemic. They chuckled at the idea that NYPD would attempt to make these areas COVID safe when I inquired. A court clerk told me that no HEPA filters or local units had been ordered for the holding or interview areas, despite their being ordered for other areas of the courthouse. She also made clear that DCAS is responsible for the area on the lawyer's side of the interview areas, and that NYPD was responsible for the holding areas. Mock J, in a recent email to defender organizations, indicated that air purifiers are now located in courthouse areas, previously identified with ratings below MER 13 filtration, and they are now opening windows. I saw the opposite. There are no filters in the arraignment holding or interview areas, and a court officer made clear to me that all windows had been sealed shut upon an order to seal them shut. There are those who might say that even if courthouse areas are unhealthy, it's okay because vaccinated folks are completely protected and have nothing to fear. Unfortunately, as we all know, many of our clients remain unvaccinated. We have learned that many NYPD and court officers are unvaccinated, and even vaccinated people can be carriers, of course, of the virus, infecting those unvaccinated and immune compromised family members, clients, and colleagues. Imagine going to a dentist's office that has no ventilation. Even if you were vaccinated, would you feel comfortable going for a teeth cleaning if you knew that, that for a half hour, you'd be with an unvaccinated hygienist and unvaccinated patients in the reception area? The arraignment interview booth is a professional setting just like a dentist's office. Like patients, clients of ours deserve a safe space to meet with their lawyer and await their arraignment. OCA's own consultant, AKF, which Lisa mentioned earlier, reported to the chief judge recently that buildings where MERV-13 filtration cannot be upgraded should be provided with local recirculating units with high efficiency filters or HEPA. That same consultant recommends that local filtration devices with UV capability be provided to spaces that don't have or can have MERV-13 filtration. The report said that those, I'm sorry, that those spaces include meeting rooms, large conference rooms, and bathrooms. The report stated, quote, these units increase the air circulation rates in area where multiple people may be meeting, unquote. That precisely describes the arraignment booths. Within person arraignments on the verge of returning, we need an outside consultant like microecologies to examine the arraignment holding and interview areas to determine if the airflow meets safety guidelines. If they don't, then we need to upgrade these hidden areas with HEPA filters and anything else recommended by the court's own consultant. And finally, I just wanna emphasize, again, as a lawyer on the ground who works there every day, what two of my colleagues mentioned about the revolution of virtual appearances for a client as an equity issue can't be overemphasized. I've had clients appearing in court while taking a break from work, or even I've had one client who was chopping vegetables in the back of a restaurant and didn't have to miss even cutting a carrot in order to appear for 10 seconds in court. That same client not only would have missed that day, but possibly could have been fired for missing work. And all of us can give you tons of examples of clients who didn't have to find childcare, elder care, miss work, get fired because of the revolution of virtual appearance and time certain slots. Even if for those cases that return to in-person, we need for our clients and us to have the respect of giving a time certain, not for hundreds of people to have to show up at 9.30 in the morning and wait all day. The time certain and the virtual appearance has literally been a revolution in the process of the criminal courts so that the process is not the punishment. And I wanna thank you again. Thank you, really nice to see you. Uh, next up will be Ed Ness. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I want to echo what Mr. Wasserman just said. I, I've been a public defense lawyer for many, many years. I also worked in the probation department as a social worker before that. So I've been working in the system for well over 30 years. I think it cannot be underestimated how much bias affects everything in the system. From the time that the police choose to arrest somebody, from the way a prosecutor chooses to write up a case, I think it's difficult for many people to step into other people's shoes and see the circumstances that they have to experience. It's easier not to talk about it or to deny that there are unsafe conditions in the courthouse and how we don't ensure that the cells and the spaces where people are locked up are safe. The judges sit not that far away, actually, in the Raymond part, but they sit high up on a bench 
from where our clients are kept in the back. But there's such a wide chasm between the two places where people are kept. Our clients are not kept in safe spaces. They're crowded, they're dirty, the cells in the back, they're filthy. Just because someone's arrested doesn't mean they should be treated in a way that's not humane. They shouldn't be treated as someone that's less than. As defense lawyers, we go in the back so we're able to see the conditions and we experience in them ourselves, but not in the same way that our clients have to. They're kept up to 24 hours before they're able to see a judge. They're kept in situations in the cells where they're dirty, where they're open to getting infectious diseases. There should definitely be portable air filters, filter systems put there in the back. They're not there. It seems like very little has changed in all this time. It's been so many months since the pandemic started. It's only brought out the stark reality of the fact that of the unhealthy spaces there. Because before COVID, the state spaces were filthy, they were not cleaned properly. And even more so now that this pandemic has occurred, nothing has been remedied there. Really, it's essentially the same. So I really what I wanted to express in terms of reacting to what other uh, council people had said that I heard uh, Ms. Rosenthal say, I think people are not focused enough on the fact that we need more community resources to help people in their communities. I mean, it's a fact that it's poor people and black and brown people who are being locked up in a disparate way in our system. So there's no reason that we shouldn't be discussing when we're talking about reopening the courts we should be discussing about the fact that there aren't enough community resources being given to people. Again, this is brought out, this has been brought out very starkly this past year during the pandemic, when we see all the people who are on the streets suffering, whether it's through mental illness and other things, and they are not being given the community resources they need. We have so many teenagers who come through the systems, and yet we don't have enough youth programs and community resources put into those to help people. It doesn't make any sense to me. And then we focus after the fact and, and, and people will say, well, let's just lock people up again and again. I mean, the fact is the bail reform system was created in part because wealthy people can afford to pay bail. So poor people should not be stuck in jail because they don't have the resources. Yeah, I just want to say taxpayers, we spend so much money as taxpayers in terms of incarcerating people, in terms of who the prosecutors choose to write up complaints against. It doesn't make any sense for the, that money not to be put into community resources. And uh, thank you to the city council for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. Um, that is the last witness that we have registered to testify who appears to be logged on, but I will Pause for one moment. If anybody else wishes to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, seeing no hands, I'll turn it back to the chair for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Council. Um, as we uh, have come to the close of this hearing, um, I'm sure that we see that there are so many areas that need to uh, be repaired uh, within this system. Um, if, if we're looking for true justice across the board, there must be justice in our courts, the place where justice is supposed to take place for all people. What we continue to learn is that there is, there is just a plethora of inequity in our system that must be addressed, it must be taken seriously and it must be reformed. So that said, I would like to thank Mark J, DA McMahon, defenders, members of the public, of course, all of my colleagues on this committee, Council uh, Daniel Addis and Max Kampner Williams for all of their hard work on putting this committee hearing together uh, and making this hearing possible. With that, this committee meeting is adjourned.